and music choices and entertainment choices can't be a symptom of worldliness. However, if you limit your understanding of worldliness to fashion and to music preferences, you are greatly underestimating the scope of worldliness. Because worldliness is any pattern of behavior that flows out of an idolatrous heart. And we're going to see that today, hopefully, from the passage in James. James, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that the source of worldly behavior is passions that war in our hearts. And it's another reminder, as we're doing this series on the heart, it's another reminder that how incredibly important the condition of our hearts are. It may be the most vitally important aspect of who you are. It may be the most vitally important aspect about you right now in your life. The heart is the command center for the soul, as we saw last week. All of life issues forth from it. And so as you look at uh, worldliness in this passage, I want to examine this idea through two questions. Question number one, how does the heart produce worldly behavior? And question number two, how do we thwart our own tendencies toward worldliness? And so let's see, James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. To spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Now here he's linking, the, linking those behaviors uh, to worldliness in the next step here. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. What I'd like to do is really narrow our focus here on verses 1 through 4. Because this is where James is, is describing the dynamic in the heart that produces worldly behavior. And hopefully as we take a look at these things that we can all have insight into our own personal worldly tendencies. But before we do that, I want us to notice the examples of worldly behavior that James gives in this passage. He doesn't, he doesn't narrow it down to fashion. He doesn't narrow it down to entertainment choices. No, the examples he gives of worldly behavior are, verse 1, contentious quarreling. Verse 2, murder. And even, verse 3, prayer can be a worldly behavior, he's saying. Selfish Prayer is a form of worldliness, he's pointing out. And so if you wanted a concise definition of what worldliness is, I would describe it this way. It's any kind of behavior that is in disobedience to God. That uh, definition can cover a wide range of behavior. And worldliness is basically buying into the false notions of the world. And when we use the word world in that way, what we're talking about is Satan's false kingdom, his world kingdom, his system of lies and false ideologies. And that entire system exists in order to pull us away from God. That is what worldliness is. And so you can't be worldly and godly at the same time. That would be like trying to swim in two directions at once. That'd be like telling your heart to try to go in two directions at once. 
And so that leads us to the first question that I introduced earlier. How does the heart then produce worldly behavior? James really is describing it happening in, in two stages. And the first one is, it lusts after things that are not God. It lusts after things that are not God. James, in, in my version, I use the ESV, uses three words to describe this dysfunctional desire of the human heart. He uses the word passions. And that's uh, the word that we translate from the Greek to our English word uh, hedonism. A sort of uh, a deadly pleasure. An intense pleasure that goes beyond its bounds for something. He uses the word desires. He uses the word coveting. And the things that we focus those unhealthy desires on are idols. And by themselves, these things, these idols, may not be bad, but our unhealthy desire for them has elevated them to a God replacement in our life. Because we are willing to disregard and even disobey God in order to have these things. Colossians 3.5, if you want to turn in your Bibles there with me. Uh, Colossians 3, 5. It talks about how idolatry at its basic level is coming from the desire of the fallen human heart. Colossians 3, 5. Paul writes, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality. Impurity. Passion. Evil desire and covetousness. And then he explains what covetousness is. Which is idolatry. Idolatry at its core is an unhealthy lust for something that isn't God. Now there's, there's a list in your bulletins. I, I didn't uh, uh, check to see if every one of you grabbed a bulletin this morning. But along with the sermon notes, in your bulletin I have a page uh, that is a description of the typical heart idols uh, that people, especially in our cultural culture, struggle with. And uh, this list is coming from a book that I highly recommend and uh, that is in our church library, by the way, uh, called Counterfeit Gods. It's a book by Tim Keller. And you can see all the things that he lists that our hearts tend to lust after uh, in ways that are not healthy. He lists things like power and approval and comfort and control and, and success and so on. I'll let you take a look at that list. And if you didn't get one, maybe you can grab one on the way out the door. But really, anything that isn't God can become a God replacement. It can become an idol of the heart. And this tendency of the heart is why people make false gods. Now, this is why they, they build shrines and temples and put little statues in them. It's because these false gods that they make promise to satisfy that desire of their hearts. If they just give the false god what it wants. Or they worship the false god in the way that it prefers. But James, in our passage, here in James chapter 4, says that you can practice idolatry without a statue. Because wherever you find worldly behavior, you will find an idol that is enthroned on the human heart. The idols are at the source. You know, John Calvin once said about idolatry, that the human heart is an idol factory. It is continuously, 24-7, in the production of making idols of the heart. And I think he's right about that. And so this process toward worldliness begins with a dysfunctional desire of the human heart for something that isn't God, and that thing is an idol. And so the second stage of this process is that worldly behavior then results from our attempts to satisfy that idolatrous desire. Worldly behavior stems from our desire to have the idol or from the frustration that we express when we can't have that thing, when we can't have control, when we can't have power, when we can't have success and all of those things that are mentioned there. 
And I want us to see how that works by example in this passage. Look at verse 2 where James says, Okay, you covet and cannot obtain. That is the desire, the dysfunctional desire in the heart. So that you then fight and quarrel. That is the worldly behavior that results from it. Okay, so help me decide this. Can you think of anything, and, and maybe you can look at that list. Can you think of anything that would cause somebody to fight and quarrel in order to obtain it? Do you see one on that list that might be an idol of the heart at work in that situation? Shout it out. Paul, you're good for shouting something out. What do you got? Oh, okay. All right. Didn't know there was a quiz this morning. What about control? Can, can I covet control over a situation or over a person so much that it would cause me to quarrel with them? Or power? I think any number of idols would work there. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to think this morning. Okay, so let's try this with some other behaviors. Let's put some behaviors on the end of that process and you tell me what idol of the heart might be lusted for in order for that worldly behavior to result. Let's put lying at the end of that. What idol of the heart might cause me to deceive another person? Might cause me to lie? What do you think would work there? Approval. Uh, yeah, that would work. Uh, I want their approval so bad that I am willing to lie about myself so that I can sort of paint myself in a, a good way to them. Approval would work. Is there any other idol of the heart that might result in lying? Acceptance. That's right. Very similar to approval. Yeah, to, to get people to accept me, I will act deviously. I'll lie. I'll, I'll step over ethical boundaries. I know it's not right to lie. But I'm willing to do that in order for that idol to be satisfied. Hey, what about if I put provocative dress? What if I'm prone to, to, to dress in a very provocative way? I, you know... In my own heart, I know I'm probably not supposed to do that. What idol of the heart might cause me to want to, to do that? Excuse me? Attention. Attention. I could be lusting after attention so hard that I'm willing to cross that boundary about how I know I should be as far as the modesty of the, the sorts of clothes I wear and that sort of thing. Hey, what about dealing with somebody dishonestly in a financial situation, uh, in a business deal? Um, what could cause me to do that? Power, power. That's right. Uh, the more the more wealth I have, I the more I uh, the more power that comes with that. Typically, so I could be lusting after power. And, and cross over uh, a moral boundary in order for me to have that? I guess what I want you to see here is that worldly behavior, if it were like a plant, and, and you were to somehow be able to grab that behavior and pull it and begin to yank it out of your life by its root system, at the very bottom of those roots would be an ugly clump called an idol. And so idolatry then is really the basic dysfunction of the human heart. Our tendency to, to want to replace our love for God with a love for other things in an unhealthy way. And my concern is, is that we can sometimes get locked into these patterns of behavior without really realizing uh, the dynamics that are at play in our hearts. And we need to know that it's inconsistent for someone who says to be a child of God to comfortably live in entrenched patterns of worldly behavior. Because that same person ought to have another competing desire in their heart. 
There should be a desire to please God right alongside that fallen desire in your heart. And they ought to be at war with one another. They ought to be competing tendencies so that, that we are miserable when we know that we are not living to please God. And instead living to please the world. And so I think that's how worldly behavior works and how James is describing it in this passage. And so I think maybe the even better question is, how do we thwart our own tendencies toward worldliness? How do we address this process that takes place in the human heart? Well, James says that we should always respond to worldliness with repentance. And that's what he means when he says in verses 8 through 10, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. In other words, you can't, you can't go with God and you can't go with the world at the same time. Be wretched and mourn and weep. He's talking about the, the conviction of sin. The sorrowing over sin. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. And so the proper response to worldly behavior in our lives is repentance. But I would argue that most people repent at the wrong stage in this process. They repent after their worldly behavior has done harm. They, they, they repent after their lies have broken the trust of another individual. They repent after their harsh words have wounded somebody. Uh, they repent after their hands have already done harm. They, they repent after someone's reputation has been ruined by them. Uh, they repent after they have to try to put the broken pieces of a situation back together. And while there's never a bad time to repent, and we always have a gracious God and merciful God who receives us in our repentance, I would argue that the best time to repent is when that desire first stirs in the heart. It's something like this. Uh, let's say that there is a nest of deadly vipers uh, in the egg form in the room of your child. And uh, you know that uh, once those eggs hatch, you know for certain that they are going to bite your child and harm them or kill them even. And, and so let me ask you this question. Would you wait until the snakes are full grown before you remove them from the room? Would you wait until they're five feet long and their fangs are dripping with venom? When would you remove the snakes? Before they hatch, you'd get rid of the egg, wouldn't you? Before the snakes could do harm. Or you'd kill them. Although don't tell the uh, uh, PETA, People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, I suggested that, please. It's that same way with dealing with sin and worldliness. We can kill the viper of sin in its egg if we recognize when that desire, that dysfunctional desire, begins to stir in our hearts. And to that end, I would challenge each of us to be, to be aware of the tendencies of our own heart. To recognize when we have unhealthy uh, stirrings for control. To recognize when greed uh, begins to stir itself in our hearts or any number of those items that are listed there. It's better to squelch the desire than to make amends for the behavior. The sin is the deadliest, the most wicked once it is in our activity. It's given full bloom life. And begin to, it can begin to then affect our relationships and other things in our life. So be about killing that desire. Be about recognizing that unhealthy desire for something. Now the second thing that we should do to thwart this process towards worldliness is very simple. And it's to love Christ more. It's to love Christ more. And the problem with idols... Because they're like weeds, at least the weeds that grow in my backyard. 
maybe I could talk to Austin and get some really good herbicide or something at some point. But the weeds that I pull out of my backyard always come back. I'm not much of a green thumb. And idols tend to work that way. You take one out, another one grows in its place. As John Calvin said, we are in continuous production of those things, I think. And really the key to driving out idols in your heart is to force them out with a greater love. And there's no greater thing that you can do with your heart than to love Jesus Christ. In fact, your heart was created for that. And whereas the distorted desire for idols produces worldly behavior, the love of Christ produces godly behavior. And perhaps no uh, verse in the Bible expresses this concept so well as John 14, 15. And Jesus is speaking to his disciples here saying, If you love me, you will what? Keep my commands. Keep my commands. And literally, I think it could be said this way. If you love me, my commandments you will keep. A love for Christ is, is like fire in the engine of a train. I know I've used this analogy recently at our annual meeting. But it's so important. It's worth mentioning over and over again. Uh, the train of your Christian life heading on the tracks of obedience to God needs energy. And what propels that train, what causes you to move in the direction of obedience is love for Christ. It's the fire that heats the coal, that uh, evaporates the water, that creates the steam, that causes the engine to go down the tracks of obedience. And if you're trying to live the Christian life but you have no love for Christ in your heart and you're just trying to, to make it work out of dry obedience, just trying to force external standards on yourself, it's like you're behind that train trying to push it. But the love of Christ can fuel that train. The love of Christ produces obedience. That's really the secret sauce of the Christian life. It's to love Christ more. And you may ask, well, more than what? More than my family? Surely not. Yeah. More than my job? Yeah. More than my skill that I do really well? Yeah. That's the sort of claim that Christ has on your hearts. And that is the sort of love that He is worth. And so you may ask, well, how do I love Christ more? And I guess the simple answer to that is to know Him. <laughs> how could you not know how could you not love Christ if you know Him? Did He not know that this one of infinite worth, this God-man, took the path of humility and He did it for you? And that path of humility led Him to a cross where He died for you, for your sins? How could you not love a Jesus like that? You know, C.H. Spurgeon, one of my favorite quotes once said about this, I think he's right. It is better for you to have a glimpse of Jesus than to see all the glory of all the earth for all the days of your life. Let's complete the parable of the two men that came to church. Uh, would you have said, I did not have enough information to tell you, Pastor Jim, which one was the word, worldlier of the two? Well, let me give you the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. 
as the service begins that morning, the clean-cut man, the man in his tie, by the way, I have nothing against ties, begins to go through the motions as everyone sings praises to God. He's mouthing the words, but he's not even thinking about them. And as the sermon is preached, he has some vague understanding of what the pastor's saying. He does think a time or two, I hope the guy behind me is hearing that. But see, he's distracted. He's thinking about the bottom line. He's thinking about his business. He's thinking about what he needs to do later that afternoon. So that his business could do better. He's even thinking about it. And he's just even considering. He's at the point of justification. He's thinking about crossing an ethical boundary in order for him to do better at work. Do better with profit. What about the man behind him? The rough looking man. Well during the service says as a particular issue with God is, is mentioned by conviction of the Holy Spirit that man confronts that sin in his life in his own heart. And in an act of repentance he resolves there on the spot that I'm going to walk out of here and resist that sin and that tendency. And then as Jesus Christ is presented to that man, his heart begins to come alive. Just, just the mention of Jesus. You can tell that Jesus is deeply significant. And as he walks out of that service, he does so with a desire to tell someone else about Jesus. Which of the two is the worldly man? Worldliness comes in different packages. What does yours look like? And perhaps it's time for each of us to examine our own hearts. Just ask ourselves. What do I love more than Jesus? Why is that? May we be a group of people who continue to recognize the great worth the great person of Jesus Christ and to love him with wholehearted dedication. Let's pray. Father, I I thank you for revealing this tendency of our own hearts. Uh, through the writings of James, inspired by your Spirit. Uh, may we receive these things with wisdom. And may we be each experts of the tendencies of our own hearts. So that end result, we love Jesus more. Fuel the fire of the train so that we can walk in obedience to Him and in service to Him. And we ask this in His name.